So it's finally here. Dominions Divided has been a book which has been very much anticipated, at least by me. It's really the last big outing for the setting in this particular transitionary era between the Dark Age and Ilkhan era. And it has to deal with a multitude of popular factions, including some of my favorites. This is going to be a difficult video for me to make because this really is the first Catalyst book I've read that I'm not going to be giving some kind of recommendation to, with a few exceptions being noted in this review. I'm also going to state that I'm not paid by Battletech or anyone affiliated with it to make these reviews, and I do so by purchasing these directly for review. I received no advance copy either, and read the book on the 27th of January, like everyone else who bought it on day one. I will not be providing spoilers unless they are clearly marked, and this will be done in its own section of the video. I also want to point out I tend to be scathing in my criticisms if it's something I really don't like. No, I don't hate Battletech, or the factions involved, or the people who wrote this. I like all three. In fact, three of my favorite factions are in this book. I'm just going to break down why this book did not work for me. So, let's start by saying that the art in this book is fantastic. It's the best art we've gotten so far in any of the Ilkhan era source books, in my opinion. At least in terms of the consistency and overall choices in the art and how it was done. I really enjoyed this, and I was blown away by some of the spreads. It's got a top rating from me for art. There are small text bubbles that will appear throughout the book as well, displaying conversations or speeches, or written notes about the events in the book or the characters around it. And some of these are absolutely excellent, thrilling even. So again, I have to give props to the book for pulling this off almost seamlessly. And in a way, this is narratively satisfying for much of the book too. My favorite blur being when they introduce Alexander Hasek, it's fantastic. I read this in a digital format and I enjoyed the charts that were displayed in here as well. The maps were also well done and covered different times in the book perfectly. There is also an excellent part in this book on page 27 that gives a fantastic overview of the Russell Hague Dominion, breaking down parts of the society and government. One thing the book did well is build up to the events in the book. It presents the Russell Hague Dominion and some of its history very well, trying to build up a realistic nation state that embodies the mixed culture and ideals that the Dominion has. I think this was done in a way that felt natural, and I definitely felt like, prior to the Civil War, they felt more like a realistic state in the inner sphere, perhaps even more alive than some of the other states. As a society, in many ways, it borrows a bit from more modern Western systems as we currently see them, so I was able to more easily identify with them. This would change throughout the adventure, but up until that point, as a part of the presentation, this was fantastically done. Finally, I didn't notice any grammatical errors, but I wasn't proofreading exactly while going through this. Just none jumped off the page at me. If that's the case, I can at least say they did a good job in that respect as well. So I went on quite a journey with this book. When I first started reading it, I thought it might be the best source book yet. There are tons of parts I will highlight that I liked, and things that I didn't enjoy nearly as much. I think they fleshed out some of the Damocles Sanctions events a bit more, particularly involving Alexander Hasek and Karita Yori. We also get to see a fleshing out of the events at the beginning of the Ghost Bear Civil War. These parts of the book, narratively, are the best parts of the book. In fact, most of this, and the cool information through blurbs around it, is a really great read for about the first 60 pages. Action happens, events are explained, they seem to be mostly reasonable, and some of them are exciting, especially if you've not read Damocles Sanction. The least satisfying thing about the first 60 pages involves Clan Seafox, which is more or less once again dominating another sector of the Inner Sphere, which is both odd and frustrating to read. It feels like a faction mirroring Comstar, but without any of the faults or failings that Comstar and its sub-organizations had. In fact, it's more or less implied that Seafox are simply better at the things it is trying to do because of their clan origin, which I find both unlikely and annoying, uh, to be quite honest. I was going to delve into this into the spoiler review, but I really don't even want to. I expect Seafox, based on how it's been handled for some time now, to be like this. 
So I didn't detract from my experience with the book. It's just annoying to see it crop up yet again. After page 60, I ceased really enjoying almost anything in the tome and it detracts from the experience I'd had reading up until this point. First, I have to point out that Damocles' sanction already covers a lot of the really interesting things that happen between Karita and Davian, barring what I've mentioned prior. If you've not read this novel and want to see what happened between Davian and Karita, this book may provide some value to you. I'd sooner recommend Damocles' sanction, however. It's a more interesting read overall, despite Dominion's giving a bit more insight into side characters and events during this. After page 60, we begin to see resolutions to many of Ghost Bear's arcs, which are firstly rushed, and secondly seem to contradict much of what's written in terms of their responses to the situation, from earlier in the source book itself, and from the demeanor displayed that the bears themselves have, both in the book and historically, and this also can apply to the Russell Hagians as well. It also, if I dare say, makes me think less of the Ghost Bears for being kind of stupid, to be frank. It's an utterly bewildering and unsatisfying end to what started as a great plotline. It feels out of place, it feels artificial, and disconnected to the tethered sinews of the story, and it left me genuinely confused and annoyed with what the plot had become. I'm a Ghost Bear fan. It's not an Inner Sphere clan thing for me. It's the fact that the plot felt like it was pushed hard to an endpoint that was ordained, rather than actually making its way there. Worse, if this was the result that was desired, the rest of the story could have been better served by being written differently. This is the first time I've really not been able to recommend a source book or a novel since I started running the channel, and that is really unfortunate. When I read through the first half, I thought I was going to be giving this book an absolutely glowing review, as the first half is frankly better than the first half of either Tamar Rising or Empire Alone. In the end, the results seem like Ghost Bear or the Rosselhaig Dominion are a bunch of sycophants, idiots, and fools. And this is not a particularly satisfying thing to read. This might be mildly hyperbolic to say, but I use this language to stress the point home that this story's back end felt extremely out of place. It was unsatisfying, and really not only unlikely, but felt unrealistic, even in the setting of Battletech. I'll have more details in the spoiler review. The end result itself wasn't the problem. Even if it might have been unlikable in some ways, instead it's that nothing feels like it would have resulted in the events after page 60, which came before. If there is going to be a novel to flesh this out, to be quite frank, I'm not sure that I'd be interested in reading it even, given how the book itself plays out. It's just not a story that I would want to read, or that I think is good. It also feels like the entire plot is now put in place to really serve where the story is meant to go by writer fiat, rather than an organic outcropping of where the story they wrote would go. Worse, the objective of getting the Ghost Bears where they seem to want to take the story could have been written in a way that didn't make the Ghost Bears look like idiots. And it seems to have been written this way for dramatic reasons. But that just makes them look all the more foolish. I'll reiterate, I'm a big Ghost Bear fan, so this was a very disappointing read for me. So where do we begin with the spoilers? A lot of what happened in this book was covered in Damocles Sanction, interestingly enough. Damocles Sanction is a novel of the return of New Avalon to the Federated Sons and the aftermath of it, as well as the competition between Julian Davian and Eric Sandoval. They do flesh out some of this a bit more in the book, pointing out a few more instances of the two having disputes with one another. We also get more details on Toranaga's interrogation on New Avalon prior to him being shot by Julian Davian. Alexander Hasek's return is probably my favorite part of the new information in the book, where we get to see his vanity, cowardice, and foolishness pulled together. We find out that the Endurians tried to assassinate him, but they really didn't, instead deliberately trying to kill someone he loved in order to make him think the Capellans did it. Just, Alexander took the wrong bait, so he invaded the Torian Concordat instead. He takes Electra, 
and then afterwards his forces are defeated as he goes on the attack further, dividing his forces and getting humiliated, defeated, and captured. The Torians go on the attack after this before Hasek is broken out of prison. Kirita Yori has her own role to play. We discover her undermining Toranaga for her own political power, but also because she's nervous about how much the Combine has overextended. She's proven correct in her assessment by the end of the book. She gains the loyalty of her subjects and maneuvers herself quite well considering the chaotic situation emerging all around her. This book has only further cemented that Yori is probably my favorite successor lord in the series at the moment. From Damocles' sanction we know Toranaga's fate, and the fate of many of his loyalists. He is killed by Julian, but we did find out that while he was being interrogated, he basically gave no information and just instead was like asking about Julian Davian and Eric Sandoval's loved ones to the interrogators, it made me laugh. <laughs> I had more notes in all this. The book is brimming with details, but honestly, it feels for naught. The main act of this source book is truly about the Russell Hague Dominion and the Ghost Bear Civil War. And this is, in my opinion, incredibly poorly handled by the end of the book. And the book itself ironically spells out why. I personally think it's bizarre and bad. So let's begin. We discover a lot about the Russell Hague Dominion and Ghost Bear. We get a great insight into their political system and society. It's pretty cool. We also get insight into their time helping the Republic, as well as their assessment of what's going on with the Wolf Empire and Jade Falcon attacks towards Terra. They realize Alaric is making a play for Terra, but choose to observe rather than intervene, if such a thing was even possible. They know before the last blow happens that the Republic would collapse and never recover. Page 27 is incredibly informative about their society and government. They congratulate Alaric on his victory, which is seen in the novel A Question of Survival, and it is handled quite well. But we do get a bit more details about what they find out on Terra. They talked to the civilians and discovered that Alaric might be a bit of a tool. And his own words of progress, glory, and the Star League may be a bit less cool than he was implying they were. Still, they agree to hold a referendum or a plebiscite to see if they are going to join the new Star League. During this process, the civilians begin to fracture politically. New fissures open up in their society, with people across cultural backgrounds taking different sides. And this happens across all of the different castes as well. In fact, the civilians begin to organize into various extremist groups even, but end up becoming two broad coalitions, the Joiners and the Deniers. The Joiners talk about the return of the caste system and the return of the eugenics program being enforced on the population as being a good thing, which for some reason doesn't turn off huge swathes of the population immediately, especially given it was overwhelmingly popular in Clan Ghost Bear and the Dominion that it was done away with, which they tell you in the book. In fact, in that very book, they have what is in essence a national holiday for the day where these practices were abolished. It was not a popular thing. The Dominion votes to join the Star League, but it's split by the narrowest margins, something like 50.5% versus 49.5% seemingly. The knife's edge is the difference between the two sides. Again, we know this from a question of survival, and it's handled well. We're even given four pages of examples of major planets and how they handled the situation as it was unfolding. It is given great detail. We're given a perspective from the deniers and the joiners in some detail too, with the most important being, in my overall opinion, the joiners. They are elated, overjoyed. Large numbers of them try signing up to be warriors as they feel they're going to get a leg up in a restored clan society by being among the most respected in the warrior caste. There are debates across social media in the Dominion. Influencers begin using their pull in one direction or another. People start denouncing one another. Things start turning ugly, very ugly. In fact, it looks as though people begin to harden as to what is happening. On Vega, Alshane and various other planets, radicals from all sides of the spectrum began to appear and began to prepare for conflict. Everything up until this point was a great read. Then Alaric refuses the Dominion's entry into the Star League. In fact, in A Question of Survival, we are told, Ilkhan Ward has rejected our vote out of hand. The response quote being, that is what it says, but he cannot just tell us to hold another vote until it is unanimous. We get similar wording and writing in the book, 
as the Rossel Hagian politicians tried to understand why they were rejected. People try to as well. And this is where the book frankly undermines the end results within. It doesn't just apply to people, it applies to the politicians. And there is wording to that effect, and I will include it here. Quote, That evening saw the prince and the cons overlooking the ruins of their plans. While a new plebiscite was certainly possible, an outcome in favor of the Ilkhan was not. By demanding a better result in such an insulting manner, he had likely turned even more of the dominion against him." Unquote. Quote, Objectively, the question had to be asked whether the Dominion wanted to be part of the Star League at all. Clearly, a little less than half of the realm did not. The question of whether they would have nonetheless accepted their loss and gone on to support the majority decision was now moot. Earned or not, Alaric Ward's apparent disregard for those below the warrior caste was becoming increasingly clear. The citizens of the Dominion had voted expressing their voice and will in the direction of their nation. The Ilkhan had rejected that. The canny politicians of the Dominion Council knew it would be child's play for pundits to turn the Ilkhan's refusal into a slight on the restless civilians." Unquote. So the problem is, people generally don't take being insulted well. The joiners and the deniers are depicted after this as becoming more extreme. Fights break out, people get lynched in the streets, civil war escalates as civilians and then later warriors begin killing one another to enforce their ideas. The Toman, in essence, kills 30% of itself through the civil war and rampant challenges that happen from within. And by the way, all of this is fine. There is only one problem. Alaric insulted everyone, and it's acknowledged several times. He also did so nakedly as to put the ghost bears in a bad position. And he did this while actively disregarding the core of their society. And the politicians and leadership are aware of this. Quote, Almost universally, the first reaction was outrage. How could have the Ilkhan insulted the Dominion so? The shared outrage soon took on factional flavors. For deniers, it was a moment of relief. Yes, it was embarrassing to be rejected, but ultimately they got what they wanted. For the joiners, who had spent months pushing to join the Star League, it was an insult that had to be answered for, and the Ilkhan himself named the culprits, the deniers. Resentment exploded on every world the news reached. Tensions rose inside communities, even inside of families, barely held in check by Dominion traditions, but it would not hold." Unquote. The problem is, is like, while it is reasonable that many of the joiners would respond this way, a lot of joiners would genuinely just think this guy's an asshole and probably would not want to fight and die for him. And they, which again, they actually kind of explain earlier with a previous quote on the previous page. So like, I just, I just don't get like where this ends up going, but I will continue. We're given insight into the clan warriors as well, where it's explained they would have strong feelings for the Ilkhan itself due to being indoctrinated but they was also given the explanation that they have many within their Sibcos and families who weren't warriors, who many want to protect. And even among the warriors, it's far from black and white in terms of support of the Ilkhan as a result. In fact, Galaxy Commander Lars Mugnanson becomes more or less a denier within the book. He is killed though, trying to defend the actions of his men by Prince Muraborg, who saw him as a political threat. The joiners, acting this way, especially among extremists, even in a clan society, would have pushed more people into the deniers camp. A lot more. The civil war of course breaks out, that's fine, but instead of like the organic growth of this being that the deniers kind of get more support, the unity council, the leaders of clan ghost bear in essence, the politicians, still are split 50-50 when they get together on Christmas to vote themselves bypassing the people and expressing the government's desire. Prince Muraborg, the leader, knowing all of what's happening, knowing Alaric is undermining him, knowing his society is tearing itself apart, knowing his military is at each other's throats, and it's all Alaric's fault, votes to join the Star League, breaking the tie, which shouldn't have been a tie, and resulting in yet more riots. But the reason why this is insane and stupid 
is that people stop acting even in the irrational ways we understand people do. An outsider coming in and insulting you will almost never garner more support. It will always lead to less support. This is, this is not hard to understand. Politicians and political powers within these places tend to not appreciate being undermined. Countless numbers of people die. Others have their lives ruined. And the military, in its own self-inflicted violent, kills or otherwise removes 30% of its own forces. And Prince Muraborg just shrugs and votes to join the Star League anyway. Though he does know he needs to release another referendum. To confirm it, of course. Well, why vote to join anyway? Does it quell the chaos? Not really. It enhances it for a while, actually. Eventually, the military takes control of the situation. Vaguely. And then the plan is just to overtly and nakedly invade the Draconis Combine. Most clan societies don't need an excuse. But you'd think that they'd maybe be a little tired after murdering their supposed family for a year and a bit. Worse still, somehow the joiners and deniers set aside their differences. The ones they'd been literally killing one another over. And begin signing up to join in the effort for their great crusade against the dragon. Which is done to somehow unify the people and to prove to Alaric that he had made some type of monumental mistake not allowing the powerful Clan Ghost Bear to just join the Star League. So in essence, Clan Ghost Bear votes to join, gets insulted overtly, and denied entry into the Star League. They then take it badly and start killing one another. And the book lays out within its pages why political support would, in their world, and even our own, drain away from the joiners. The government then votes to join anyway. Months after, while the Ilkhan had undermined them, after the military and people continue to go mad killing and persecuting one another, under the rule of a leader who is clearly questionably capable in the extreme. And then people set aside their differences to invade the Draconis Combine and in no way question the hostility of their government to this other power, though it is a hated power, especially after they basically got insulted by their new friend, oh, and after they had brothers killing brothers over the fact that their new friend said that the civilians shouldn't have a say and that they kind of sucked. There is more to this source book, but I went from reading this with excitement to staring at pages with confusion. How to get from point A to point B in this book requires leaps in thinking that I personally find questionable. It's not the outcomes that are the problem. Ghost Bear invades the Combine? No problem. Ghost Bear has a civil war? Makes sense. But the way the outcome of the war goes, despite the way it's written very clearly in the book, and the way the public evolves, is in a word baffling. One can't just hide behind the idea that this is a clan society either. Clan societies have gone to war and caused countless deaths for lesser insults than Alaric delivered. Clans have pride. Apparently Ghost Bear has no such thing. The Rosselhig Dominion even less, apparently. And yet worse, at the end of all of this, in the Rosselhig Dominion section, it's spoken of how Alaric has incredible power and influence over the Dominion's affairs. Why? Again, after this debacle, with so many dead, why would anyone think fighting for his cause was just? Especially the majority of the populace. When it started because he was being a total asshole to them, on purpose. Which both the politicians and the civilians understand. Hell, even the military brass gets it. If they wanted Ghost Bear in the new Star League, have Alaric accept the vote. You could still have a civil war after the fact if that's what you wanted. You could still have them invade the Draconis Combine if that's what you wanted. Even if it's meant to have them not join in the end, why are they genuinely this stupid? Like, history's not perfect, and people make dumb decisions in history. But many of the decisions in this book flies in the face of any reasonable reason, and continuously does so. It's not like a few things here or there where people are irrational. Every single person's decision is increasingly irrational until we find out that Prince Muraborg didn't like Magnuson because they were rivals, but it's never really explained that they're rivals up until you read the last part of the book, and that's why he had him killed. Overall, it, it's, it is extraordinarily badly put together at the very least and defies most logic as to how they would behave. Hell, even how Ghost Bear is acting near the end a lot of it is just them trying to impress Alaric. 
It comes off as Ghost Bear being a bunch of needy ex-spouses trying to impress on the one who rejected them. Is that what Ghost Bear and Rossel Hague have become? Empire Alone is a great book because I can accept that Nicole Hallis Hughes is a moron, to be frank. I didn't speak much about it in my review simply because I thought it was pretty self-evident. I read Hunting Season, twice, and I read Redemption Rights before I got it. Despite the protestations to the contrary, I think she's an incredibly incapable leader, who clearly suffers from some type of severe anxiety. That doesn't make her character bad, but it makes her a bad leader. So when the Free Worlds League didn't just steamroll the entirety of the Wolf Empire, I could justify that, it could make sense. Why does the Dominion seem to have similar problems? Why does the Dominion have people act en masse even more irrationally than possible? Few people take insults from other leaders well, even if they originally supported them. Even if they had been treating him like with religious reverence, which it's almost implied. There are religious leaders in the past of the Earth who have been killed by mobs or by other states of people in the same faith for being total pricks to them. The worst part is, to me, the book itself tells you why the situation becomes less and less likely as it goes on early in the book. I'm not really going to speak about Dominions Divided for a while after this. Not on a video, and not on stream. It's just too much of a disappointment for me. But needless to say, I did not like this book. And I do not like making videos where I have to say something sucks. Often when it comes to any criticism of the Ilkhan era, people disregard it as being, well, it's the journey, not the destination. And I can see that. If this is the journey, though, I don't know, because I found this book to be exceptionally disappointing in its plot and how it was pieced together. As the Ghost Bears are the real focus of it, in my opinion. That's why, to me, so much of the attention to detail is spent on them in the book. In my opinion, this book was supposed to be the breakout moment for the Ghost Bears. You can tell that there was so much love in crafting their backstory, into trying to make the Rosselhag Dominion feel like a part of Battletech. And before the latter part of this book, it really does feel that way. About halfway through the book, I was hyped and excited. It's more or less all discarded in favor of an overarching plot that more or less sacrifices the brain cells of everyone in the Dominion. There were ways to get them there anyway, at least without making them look like complete fools. It's not... it's just not what we got. And no, this isn't even that I was expecting a different outcome before I picked up the book. My excitement was from the storyline being so detailed and carefully done at first even explaining what happened internally and how the politics worked. And then the latter half happened and washed away all the good work that was there prior. These books are hard to put together. It requires a lot of people talking to one another, putting plot points together for future novels, other source books, and future plots beyond. Not every book ends up being a hit. Sometimes ideas that one thinks are good, who can otherwise make great pieces, just don't click together and it just doesn't work. It's never a perfect art, and you're never going to make everyone happy. I am sure there are going to be many of you that enjoyed this book, or have differing opinions on the material, and that's great. I, myself, have gone through my notes and reread the book while making this review, and I have come away with a very negative opinion of the Ghost Bear portions of it, which really hurts my enjoyment of the entire book. That is why I don't recommend this book, and I think that's unfortunate. I just don't think it lands. Which is even a bigger shame because I loved A Question of Survival, and I loved Damocles Sanction. They're my favorite novels from the Ilkhan era, and both are related to this source book. I really didn't enjoy this one. The big problem is now, out of the entire setting of the Ilkhan era, I just don't think there's a single clan narrative that I enjoy outside of G.E. Kistu's Jade Falcons. Which really, really ejects me from a lot of the content going forward. I will be watching from the side a bit regarding where the story goes from here, but my interest at this point in this particular era is really at the lowest ebb it has been, unfortunately. I will still cover mechs from this era that I think are necessary, but I don't know how invested I'm going to be in covering novels and source books unless there is something that really catches my eye. I have promised to cover one novella from this era, 
uh, from someone uh, who I talked to, and that is going to be something I cover very soon. But that decision was made before I reviewed Dominions Divided. If you want to check this book out for yourselves, I will be including a link in the description below. Feel free to tell me I'm wrong if you think so, if you decide to go ahead with picking up this book. But I don't expect my opinion to change after this. It's a definite downer for me as a book. For me to have come to a different conclusion, I would more or less have to not believe my lying eyes. So that is the review this time. I'd normally say if you enjoyed this video to hit like and subscribe and things like that, but honestly, I really didn't enjoy making this. So I guess if you enjoyed this video more than I enjoyed making it, and more than I enjoyed Dominions Divided, please consider hitting the like button and subscribing. With that, I don't know if I will catch you all in the comment section below, but I will try to. Have yourselves a great weekend, and goodbye.